Welcome to the MD Edge Daily News for Tuesday, July 3rd. I'm Nick Andrews. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, meth use is climbing among opioid users. Also today, after being diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, the pain remains. And high levels of biologic rheumatoid arthritis drugs are linked with more infections. But we begin today with an FDA approval. The Food and Drug Administration has approved the Zephyr endobronchial valve system for patients with severe emphysema who are experiencing difficulty breathing. The valve system is the first minimally invasive device approved in the U.S. for treating these patients. The device is designed to prevent air from entering the damaged parts of the lung, but also to allow trapped air and fluids to escape. It's about the size of a pencil and is placed into the damaged areas of the lung using a flexible bronchoscope. The approval is based on a multi-center study of patients with severe emphysema. 128 patients received the Zephyr valves and medical management, while 62 received medical management alone. The primary measure was the number of patients who achieved at least a 15% improvement in their pulmonary function score. At one year, about 48% of the Zephyr valve patients had achieved such improvement versus less than 17% of the control group. Adverse events included death, pneumothorax, pneumonia, worsening of emphysema, coughing up blood, shortness of breath, and chest pain. The valve is contraindicated in patients with active lung infections, those allergic to nitinol, nickel, titanium, or silicone, and active smokers. Dr. Tina Kiang of the FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health says that this novel device is a less invasive treatment that expands the options for these patients. As the opioid epidemic rages on, new data suggests that an increasing number of opioid users are also abusing another drug, methamphetamine. Between 2011 and 2017, the percentage of surveyed opioid users seeking treatment who reported using methamphetamine within the past month skyrocketed from 19% to 34%. This is according to a study presented at the College on Problems of Drug Dependence. Specifically, the use of crystal meth went up by 82 percent, while the use of prescription stimulants went up by 15 percent. In contrast, the use of marijuana went up by just 6 percent, and the use of muscle relaxants and prescription sleep drugs fell by more than half. A recent report published in The Lancet notes that while the opioid crisis has exploded, the lull in the methamphetamine epidemic has quietly and swiftly reversed course. It now accounts for 11% of the total number of overdose deaths. Researchers saw the largest increases in co-use of the two drugs in the West, Northeast, and Midwest regions, as well as in both rural and suburban areas. A co-use increase was also seen in those between the ages of 18 and 44 and those of white race. Pain continues to plague rheumatoid arthritis patients at one year after diagnosis. This is according to research from the Canadian Early Arthritis Cohort presented at the European Congress of Rheumatology. Researchers report that at baseline, nearly two-thirds of patients had pain. At one year of follow-up, nearly 25% had remaining pain. Dr. Vivian Bykirk is a rheumatologist at the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. Dr. Bykirk says that she thinks that the first 12 months are a critically important window because it's when acute inflammatory pain may transition to chronic inflammatory pain. In this study, Researchers sought to investigate pain evolution in the year following a diagnosis of RA, as well as to see whether there were any predictive factors for the remaining and widespread pain. The baseline predictors for remaining pain at one year were high baseline pain, sleep difficulties, and disability measured by the Health Assessment Questionnaire Disability Index. The Disability Index was the strongest predictor for lingering and widespread pain. The number of comorbidities also appeared to predict lingering pain, 
though there was not a statistically significant difference. And finally today, patients with RA who had a high serum level of biologic immunomodulatory drugs have a 51% higher rate of infection during their first year taking the drug. That's compared with RA patients who maintain usual or low serum levels of the same drugs. This is according to an analysis presented at the 2018 European Congress of Rheumatology. The analysis focused on 703 patients who had data while they took any of five biologic drugs. Those drugs are adalimumab, sertolizumab, etanercept, infliximab, and tocilizumab. The patients in the study were on average about 59 years old. About three-quarters were women, and they had been diagnosed with RA for about five to seven years. About 22% were also on treatment with a steroid, and most patients had not received prior treatment with a biologic agent. The researchers tallied 229 diagnosed infections in the subgroup with high serum levels of their biologic drug, and 63 infections in those with levels below this threshold. Analysis of the accumulation of infections over the course of one year of follow-up showed that this difference in infection rates became apparent after about two months of exposure. It then began to diverge more sharply after about five months. The results also showed that the rate of serious infection, meaning those requiring intravenous antibiotics or hospitalization or resulting in death, were similar in the two subgroups. And that concludes this edition of the MD Edge Daily News. You can find links to these stories in the podcast description. I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. And I'm Nick Andrews. You can make us a part of your daily routine by subscribing wherever podcasts are found.